Good afternoon, good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. I said good, but unfortunately times are not good. Darkness has once again descended upon Europe as Vladimir Putin has escalated Russia's aggression towards Ukraine, which of course started already in 2014 and launched a large scale armed attack causing death, destruction and displacement. Our thoughts are with the brave defenders of democratic Ukraine and all those who suffer from Russia's gross violation of international law. My name is John Sakow. I work as an analyst at the Stockholm Center for Eastern European Studies, which is an independent center financed by the Swedish government and located at the Swedish Institute for Foreign Affairs. Today's webinar is about Sweden's neighbor across the Baltic Sea, Germany, and its Ostpolitik, that is, Germany's policies towards Russia, but also towards the other states in Eastern Europe. Things are obviously happening as we speak, and we will talk about recent developments, but we will also take a step back and look at how German policies have evolved up until this point in time. Germany's role is important for many reasons. The country is the largest one in the EU and crucial for the formulation of EU policy in basically all areas relevant for the region to name just one. We will discuss key aspects of Germany's policies, but I think it's safe to say that Berlin during the last 10 years has tried to strike a balance between, on the one hand, dialogue and cooperation with Moscow, and on the other hand, and increasingly so, also tougher measures towards Russia, combined with increased support to other countries in Central and Eastern Europe. The debate and sometimes also criticism of Germany, has often been about the balance between these two tracks. As for dialogue and engagement with Moscow, Germany has, for example, had a special role in the Normandy format regarding Eastern Ukraine, together with France. And since 2014, uh, most likely had more contacts with Moscow than any other Western country. There are also other aspects. Germany, for example, imports significant amounts of Russian gas uh, and oil. But Germany has also agreed to sanctions against Moscow, occasionally even pushed for them. It's also a NATO country, not yet spending 2% of its GDP on defense as per the alliance, uh, alliance's goal, uh, but it's participating in, in NATO's nuclear sharing arrangement and deploying soldiers to Lithuania as part of NATO's reassurance and deter deterrence measures. Often, these policies are explained as having historical roots. References are typically made to Germany's dramatic 20th century with two world wars, a divided Germany, and later reunification. But history can be interpreted in many ways, and emphasis can be put on different events and aspects. And there may be different views regarding what Russia's conflicts really are about. This event was planned already before Russia launched its large-scale attack on Ukraine almost two weeks ago. The title chosen, Continuity or Change, has perhaps partly been answered, since many, including Chancellor Olaf Scholz, say that Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine marks a turning point in German foreign policy. Sacred cows are now being slaughtered. Nord Stream 2 has been scrapped. Unprecedented sanctions have been imposed on Russia. Germany will increase its defense budget significantly through a special fund totaling 100 billion euro that will facilitate a spending of more than 2% of GDP on defense every year. And Germany is now delivering weapons to Ukraine, despite recent statements about its quote unquote historical responsibility not to export weapons to conflict zones. The list can be made longer. Today, we will take a closer look at these things, perhaps question some of the things I just said, and try to get a better understanding of what the drivers and constraints for Germany's policies are. For this task, we have a stellar panel of prominent experts. I'm very happy to present Sabine Fischer from the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, SWP in Berlin, Angela Stent from the Brookings Institution and Georgetown University in Washington, DC, but currently in Texas, as I understand it. 
and John Luff from Chatham House in London. Very welcome, all of you. The outline of the discussion is that we will have introductory remarks from our panelists. After that, we will have a discussion and then open the floor for questions from the audience. Those of you who listen in using Zoom may ask questions during the Q&A function down in the center of your screens. And if you're watching our live stream on Facebook, please use the comment field there. Uh, please post your name and affiliation if you have one. I will then gather the questions and bring them into the discussion. I should also add that this webinar is being recorded and will be available to watch or later at www.ui.se. Without further ado, Sabine Fischer, if I understand you correctly, you argue that a shift in German policy started already years ago and that there in fact have been a chain of events with several small turning points preceding the recent one. Could you please elaborate on this? Yeah, thank you very much, um, John. And thank you very much also to all the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I'm aware that I'm, so to speak, the German on the panel. And I'm not entirely sure if this is a good thing or a bad thing, but anyhow, I'm very happy to be here. So thank you very much. And indeed, um, um, I think there has been change and I would like to elaborate on that in three um, points. First, briefly talk about the traditional pil pillars of German, Germany's um, Ostpolitik or policy towards Russia, then indeed talk about the change in this policy, uh, specifically over the past decade. And lastly, talk about very briefly Russian perceptions and misperceptions of German um, policy towards Russia. So very briefly um, about the pillars of Germany's traditional post-Cold War approach towards Russia. I, I see three um, in particular, um, history, interdependence, and gen more generally speaking, um, Germany's strategic culture. So history, I mean, particularly, you already mentioned this, John, um, the history of the <clears throat> of yeah uh, of the twentieth century, and here specifically um, the the Second World War and of course the end of the Cold War and Germany German unification. So there is this combination of sen a sense of responsibility and a sense of gratitude that for a very long time impacted um, Germany's policy towards Russia very heavily. Interdependence. I would like to stress here that. Um, unlike, um, I mean, you know, inter interdependence is always between Germany and Russia is, om, or, or is, om, is very often described as <clears throat> economic in particular. I think it's broader. Economic interdependence indeed plays an important role, but there's also, or was also political and also societal interdependence. And these three areas or levels are very closely intertwined. And as you all know, this interdependence, the economic interdependence, but also the political interdependence, and at, at times or partly the, the interdependence at the societal level, transformed um, into an entanglement that had problematic um, political implications. So networks, um, transnational networks between economic um, actors, business actors, um, but also political actors, if you think of Gerhard Schröder and others, um, that of course had an, an, an impact on Germany's policy as well. More generally speaking, third point um, is Germany's strategic culture, or as others would say, lack thereof, which in Germany is um, often called a culture of restraint with, with re respect to everything that is related to defense, power politics, um, and also policy or political instruments in international crisis situations that go beyond diplomacy. Um, and I think this too is, I mean, you know, it has been a very um, important part of, of uh, Germany's foreign policy culture, if you like, and that this too had, had um, a very strong impact on Germany's um, policy towards Russia. Second point, as John already mentioned, um, I think there has been a lot of change, um, specifically over the past um, decade. Um, and yeah, this change, I think, I mean, consecutive German governments over the past 10, 12 years have become more critical towards Russia and have expressed this criticism 
in their political approaches. And there has also been change in uh, public opinion um, and the public image of Russia in German um, society. And I think there are some very important milestones um, in this development. Um, the first key milestone that I see is indeed Putin's return to the Kremlin in uh, 2011. And then um, the, the crackdown uh, on mass, mass protests against rigged uh, Duma elections and also Putin's return to the Kremlin um, in 2011 and 2012. I mean, this basically terminated the German dream of a modernization partnership with Russia. And I think this was a very important um, moment in, in political thinking about Russia in Germany. Um, and later had an impact on, on, on Germany's policy towards Russia. Then, of course, uh, everything that happened in 2014, the annexation of Crimea um, and the beginning of the war in the Donbass. And this was the moment when uh, sanctions became an integral part of um, Germany's policy as an instrument um, and also I mean, yeah, uh, an integral part of the European policy um, with German, with strong German support um, towards Russia. Um, and of course, and this is another very important point, I think, uh, from a German perspective, domestic developments in Russia. So increasing authoritarianism, repressions, the constitutional reform in 2020, everything that happened um, around Alexei Navalny in 2020 and 2021. This had a very heavy impact on public opinion as well in Germany. Um, and I mean, this is actually, it's a, it's, I think um, this is a very important thing to know about uh, Russia's image in German society. Um, I mean, I, I think until the beginning of the war that we are seeing now, Russia's aggression against Ukraine, um, public opinion in Germany about Russia was divided and threat perceptions were mainly um, linked to domestic developments in Russia. So Russian autocracy was perceived as a greater threat than Russia's military or militarized policy in the Russian neighborhood, for instance. I think this has changed now, but this was, um, this was the state um, until the beginning of this war. Um, so I think to cut a long story and a complex story short, the about phase that we saw um, on the 27th of February, uh, Federal Chancellor Olaf Scholz's speech in front of the Bundestag um, and the announcements he made um, on that day, um, that was actually the, the peak or if you like, the culmination of this development of change. And now we have a German policy that does not rest exclusively on diplomacy, but indeed also on sanctions since 2014. And, um, and this is um, the new element on the ideas of um, deterrence and defense. Um, and this is indeed, it's a very fundamental change, I think. Um, and it also, I mean, the crisis really hit an, a government that was new and that was, um, that had completely different priorities. I think this is also a very important point. I mean, if you look at the election campaign last year, geopolitics, foreign policy, almost no reflection, almost no reflection of the challenges that, you know, um, that were building up uh, in the East, in the South, China, etc. cetera. So um, yeah, so we have had a new government that was, basically taken by surprise by this, um, by this um, crisis and the, the, the speech and the changes of 27th of February are the result of that. Very briefly, um, my last point, um, I mean, what always struck me and really, yeah, surprised me was how, how Russia repeatedly underestimated, misread, and misinterpreted um, the changes that were happening in Germany and the changes in Germany's Russia policy. And, and I, I mean, I um, could, have, I, I mean, I have observed that over a very long time in 2011, 12, in 2014, 
um, Moscow did not expect that Germany would become a main or the, the most important promoter of, of EU sanctions. Um, and I think the 27th of February, again, surprised um, the decision uh, makers um, in Moscow. And I think this is based on what I would call, would call a kind of double misinformation or misinterpretation, because I think the anal analysis in Moscow is wrong um, and has been wrong for a very long time about so there's a, a very sort of um, distorted, actually, um, picture of, of the political situation and political approaches in Germany. But it is also a result of exactly the entanglement that I described before, because the actors, the German actors who maybe had the ears of relevant people in the Kremlin in Moscow, I don't think that they really projected an adequate picture of the situation in Germany and the debate in Germany about Russia um, to their counterparts um, in Moscow. So, yeah, this is where we are. Personally, I, I think much of the changes that we have seen came too late. Germany was very often behind the wave and not in front of the wave, which is extremely regrettable. This is where we are now, and um, yeah, I think colleagues will um, will complement my my speech, and I'm very I'm looking forward to listening to them. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sabine Fischer. Angela Stent, you have also followed both Russia and Germany for a long time. How would you describe things, the evolution of Germany's Ostpolitik, and the key factors? Please. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to be on this uh, webinar with these great colleagues. So I started out my professional life as a graduate student writing a PhD about Willy Brandt's Ostpolitik. So I actually want to go back 50 years now and just look at the basic premises of the Ostpolitik because I think they have had an influence on German policy in the past 50 years. And they have been, I think, decisively you know, rejected by now on February the 27th. But uh, they were very important in influencing uh, West German policy toward the Soviet Union and then German policy toward Russia after unification. So what were the initial premises of Brunt's hostility? And I will do it um, in te telegraph it uh, briefly. The first one was Wandel durch Einigung, that is to say change through rapprochement. The idea that the key to having a more productive relationship with Russia was through dialogue, through compromise, um, through finding common ground with Russia, with the Soviet Union, which would eventually lead to a softening, if you like, of the Soviet position on the German question, on the two Germanys. And that was, of course, the fundamental motivating force, uh, you know, after 1969. But clearly linked to that, and we've seen that also, of course, questioned in these recent days, was Wandel durch Handel, change through trade. Uh, the idea that closer economic interconnections would have a positive effect on the political relationship at that time between the Soviet Union and the Federal Republic. Um, and that somehow economic interdependence would moderate Soviet political behavior. And so hence the first gas pipeline deal, uh, which was signed over 50 years ago, uh, bringing uh, Soviet gas to West Germany uh, was really um, an important aspect of the more general Ostpolitik and was thought to be you know, something that would really positively influence the political re relationship going forward. Um, now, the supporters of this policy, of course, would argue uh, that June, the German unification was the ultimate success of Willy Brandt's Ostpolitik. And of course, in thinking about this, as I was thinking about what I was going to say today, um, one can maybe question some of that. You could argue that the GDR's increasing inability to deal with its population, its kind of bankrupt political system based on increasing repression. Um, and also Moscow's total lack of strategy towards the German question and the GDR, um, you know, it, by the time 1989 came around, that that really led to the collapse of the wall and unification. Uh, but still, I think very much uh, it was believed um, in Germany at the time that it was the Ostpolitik that had produced this result. So I'm going to fast forward now uh, briefly to the 1990s and just reiterate some of the things that Sabina said. Obviously, German gratitude towards Russia 
for allowing unification to take place peacefully um, very much influenced uh, German policy. So a willingness to support Russia uh, economically, uh, Germany was, uh, you know, financially, this was all uh, very important. And Germany was key, I think, in trying to bring Yeltsin's Russia into Western, different kinds of Western institutions. It was an advocate uh, for Russia in Europe, uh, playing this, this key role there. Um, and, um, you know, at that time, the Yeltsin administration, of course, was, uh, you know, didn't like the fact that it believed that the United States wasn't treating it as an equal. Um, and I think it was, you know, gratitude towards Germany for that. And what was interesting at the time was that I think some Germans believed that the United States wasn't sympathetic enough to all of the concerns that this post-Cold War impoverished, rather chaotic Russia expressed. And I remember at the time, a German official telling me the problem with the United States was that we had empathy deficit disorder, that we weren't sympathetic enough to Russia's complaints about the way it was being treated. So I think throughout the 90s, that was an element uh, certainly of what Germany was doing then. And of course, Germany became increasingly important economically to Russia in the 1990s. Now, um, when Putin came to power, I would say, uh, you know, the significance of Germany for Russia uh, did change. Putin was, after all, the German in the Kremlin, uh, described by Alexander Ra. He had his experience in Dresden. Um, you know, when I think back to the speech he gave in the German Bundestag in 2001, this was, you know, Putin in year one or year two, reaching out to Germany, wanting better relations with the West. It's unimaginable that we could hear a speech uh, from him like that today or even three weeks ago. Um, uh, and so um, the anticipation, I think, then was that the German-Russian relationship would obviously continue to be the key uh, relationship for Russia, uh, certainly in Europe and maybe in the West. Um, so um, I, I would say that the sort of change through rapprochement, um, I think until 2014, um, Germany really was committed uh, to exploring as many avenues as it could to engage with Russia, improve relations with Russia, partnership for modernization, attempts to obviously resolve the, uh, the, tr the problem uh, in Moldova, Transnistria, um, and trying to persuade Russia that greater integration uh, with the West was in its interests. Um, and yet none of these German policies, I think one has to say now, did very much or anything really to temper the kind of greater repression that Sabina has already described that was happening in Russia, or indeed to temper Russia's policy uh, towards Germany or toward Europe. Um, and we saw a Russia throughout all these German attempts that was becoming more aggressive um, at home and more aggressive abroad. Um, and that all of these partnerships and modernization have done nothing to create the institutions of a modern state in Russia. And if you look at Russia today, it's run by a small group of people from the intelligence services and lacks many of the institutions that Germany really tried hard with the European Union uh, to create in Russia. Now, and how about the Rundeloy handle? How did that fare, the change through trade? Um, it's become increasingly clear throughout the, uh, Putin's time in office that he has done everything he can to separate uh, the economic from the political relationship, to pursue closer economic ties, but to ensure that that doesn't really have any impact on the overall political ties. Um, obviously, we have uh, Germans who have been interested in uh, their the lucrative economic deals with Russia. Uh, Gerhard Schroeder has already been mentioned. I will say his name and say no more about this. But obviously, you do have a constituency, or you did until last week, uh, of Germans who very much believed in the importance of pursuing uh, these economic ties with Russia. Um, so when you fast forward to February the 27th, I mean, to me, this was a sea change and really a fundamental repudiation of 50 years of premises about dealing with Russia, policies that Germany really tried to pursue to, to temper, if you like, Russian behavior, to integrate Russia more in the West, have really now come um, to an end, a, a, a very tragic end with this invasion of Ukraine. Um, again, when I watched Chancellor Scholz's speech uh, on the 27th, and I just look at uh, what he promised to do, and you've already mentioned much of that, John, it's the 1,000 anti-tank weapons and 500 Stinger surface-to-air missiles. 
And only a week before, Germany was still saying it really couldn't send arms to Ukraine because of its historical responsibilities um, and, and its desire not to, you know, to provoke a greater conflict. Um, Germany spending now more of 2% on its GDP after decades of saying it really couldn't do that. Uh, and this starts in the year 2022. Obviously, the support of Germany for its East European NATO allies, uh, great, greater military support, greater financial support, um, the halting, of course, of Nord Stream 2, um, and then joining all the financial sanctions, again, against Russian banks, uh, excluding some of them from the SWIFT um, system, export controls, massive sanctions, uh, a pact which really, again, a few weeks beforehand, Germany had been very reluctant to say that it was joined. Uh, and of course, banning Russia Today and Sputnik uh, from the German airwaves. So all of this signals at least a real rupture, a break in 50 years of policy. Um, and the idea that engagement with, with Russia was, was you know, paramount, very important to keep these contacts open. Obviously, Chancellor Schultz went to Moscow. He's been in contact uh, with Putin um, even since the, the war began. Germany really questioning um, these premises. So I guess my question is going forward, and I'm sure we will talk about this, um, what does this do in the longer run? I mean, some of it will have to do obviously with what happens um, in this war. Will there be a new equilibrium? Will there be a recalibration going forward? But right now the rupture seems quite drastic. Uh, and I will be interested also to hear particularly from Sabina, uh, what German public opinion um, is, is saying about this. I've looked at the huge demonstration that took place in Berlin after, uh, after the war broke out, but how this is impacting public opinion, particularly in the East. Excellent points. Thank you so much. Last but not the least, John Luff, you recently came out with an excellent book titled Germany's Russia Problem, which suggests criticism. Uh, what is this Russia problem that Germany uh, has, or at least has had? And how do you th see things in light of recent events? Please. Thank you, John, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm grateful uh, for the mention of the uh, of the book, and I'll explain shortly why I chose to write the book under that title. Um, but also grateful for the the, the two um, introductions from uh, Sabina and Angela, which I think have set the scene extremely well. I, I was motivated to write this book because I was so interested in how Germany had misread Russia over really most of the, um, the, the, the 20 or so years uh, before 2014. Germany being a country with a deep interest in Russia, um, great expertise uh, on the country in, in many areas and uh, successive governments that wanted to build a successful relationship with Russia. There's no doubt about that. But there were things that got in the way. And if I were to try to sort of summarize what I felt were the, um, if you like, contributed to being the blinkers um, that, that prevented Germany really seeing what was happening in Russia, um, particularly during the Putin years, then it's really a combination of, of different things. And it's a, a complex combination of fear, sentimentality about Russia, um, guilt, historical guilt, of course, the gratitude that uh, Angela's referred to for unification and unif unification uh, really was a miracle um, back in 1990. The legacy of Ostpolitik thinking that we started to talk about uh, a little bit, and I think added also to that Germany's sense of a some kind of special responsibility uh, for Russia in, in in Europe, since Germany cares um, about Russia, and I, I think feels that its own historical experience is in some ways transferable. This country that succeeded in in, in giving up um, the, the, the 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 sense of um, it's you know special uh, role in the world. Um, uh, it's uh, the, the so-called Zonderweg, um, and uh, dealing with a country that um, un unfortunately has decided that its own uh, special path, the uh, the Russia's uh, Sobi Put, is is a one that it, it should pursue. So I, I feel that there was, uh, and that there still is, is this um, very deep relationship between these uh, two countries. 
But the, the remarkable thing from my perspective is how from really the end of the Cold War up to 2014, we saw increasingly unrealistic Russia policy from Berlin. This um, need to have maximum possible dialogue across um, multiple fronts, which Germany was very successful in building with both society and government. And at the same time, the expansion of trade. And the idea was that if you expanded trade, it wouldn't just stabilize relationships, um, the relationship between Germany, uh, between Russia and Europe. It, it would also contribute to um, building rule of law, um, making Russia, if you like, more interoperable with um, Europe. What we saw, of course, was that it didn't contribute to building uh, rule of law um, at all. And uh, so for all this uh, close contact and deep knowledge about Russia, there was just insufficient recognition of how Russia was changing and the, 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 the nature of the system that was taking root. And I'm quite st struck by the fact that there are, as, as far as I, I can identify, um, no books in the German language, at least, or have been written by German analysts that explain the, the, the criminal um, origins of the, the, the Putin system in St. Petersburg. We have a, a couple of outstanding books, um, uh, written one by the late Karen Dawisha, and more recently by um, Catherine Belton, um, the, the uh, former Financial Times journalist, which explain this extremely well. So there seemed to be, to my mind, an almost sort of conscious denial about just the nature of this system taking root and a feeling that um, with a, you know, a German speaking uh, Russian president, um, a man who uh, appeared to like Germany and takes a, a deep interest in Germany, that Germany was somehow well placed, it could maintain a dialogue uh, with Russia. So we, we, we saw through um, the, the chancellorships of Kohl, Schroeder and Merkel, um, up at least until 2014 in the case of Angela Merkel, a remarkable uh, consistency uh, of approach to, uh, towards Russia. But I do agree that in, in 2014, there was a, a really a sort of sharp change in policy, but not a transformation of policy. And what we're seeing now, it feels much more like a transformation. So Bino referred to the fact that sort of 2012 with Putin coming, coming back, then the, you know, the modernization partnership was uh, at an end. I think you can certainly reasonably conclude that it was an, at an end. It, it, um, it never seemed to me to really get off the ground because the, the, the only things that were being modernized in, in Russia um, under, under Putin's rule uh, ultimately um, were the security forces and the armed forces. Uh, so I think one, one can sort of qu question the, the whole notion of this modernization partnership. But still, up to 2014, uh, Foreign Minister Steinmeier was still talking about a modernization partnership for Russia. And I believe so even for a short while, even after the annexation of Crimea. So which tells us something just about the, 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 the policy thinking um, of the time. Um, I certainly agree that uh, the, uh, Angela referred to uh, Putin's uh, Bundestag speech in uh, 2001, an absolutely brilliant speech. Uh, I think we have to give uh, the Russians uh, credit when credit is due, brilliant speech, uh, and also very impressively delivered. And uh, if, if you look at the video footage of that speech, which up until recently was still widely quoted, you can just see the, the psychological effect of a, a young Russian president speaking German, talking about the place of Russia uh, and Germany in European culture, how this was received by the, the members of parliament. It's really quite an extraordinary uh, exp uh, spectacle. So if people listen to that uh, with, with, with great attention, um, you probably would say they didn't listen to the same degree or with the same degree of attention to Putin's Munich speech uh, six years later in, uh, in 2007. Uh, equally, the, the war in Georgia uh, in 2008, I think, was largely glossed over in Berlin. There was a belief that um, uh, President uh, Medvedev uh, could be the man, for the, the man of the future, and that uh, under him the prospects for modernization uh, might look much better. Um, but uh, it, just, it just didn't happen. I've been, uh, I was in Berlin for a couple of days last week, and I, I was very struck by, first of all, the, you know, the, the degree of shock at, um, at, what, at what has happened in Ukraine. And also by the fact that there is a, um, a level of sympathy now for Ukraine that I thought was absent in 2014, when Ukraine was the, 
was was a victim of Russian aggression for the for the first time, but of course not on on this scale. It sort of felt to me that from Berlin's perspective, uh, Ukraine was viewed as a problem in Europe's relations overall with Russia, whereas now the problem is seen very clearly as as Russia, and that that is a, a, a sea change. And I, I argue in my book that um, Germany should have been doing much more for Ukraine. And you, you could see the contradictions in German thinking about how to deal with the region um, you know, manifested in the extraordinary decision in 2015 to get behind the, the Nord Stream 2 project, the, um, the expansion of this, this pipeline under the Baltic Sea. To think that uh, a number of German companies together with the European counterparts got together in 2015 to form a consortium to back this project together with Gazprom to effectively weaken Ukraine by building bypass infrastructure um, was nothing short of extraordinary. But this seemed to be Germany wanting to have it two ways, to um, feel that somehow it was keeping a relationship with Russia may be contributing to calming that relationship by ex expanding the uh, direct gas deliveries. So there you can see some a legacy of Ostpolitik thinking, but without a sort of understanding of the wider consequences of this and, and, and how, how they might play out by demonstrating to the Russian side that actually Ukraine in some respects wasn't so important and might even be, um, in the worst case, expendable. I'll stop there. Thank you, John. Excellent. Thank you so much. Before we uh, move on uh, in the discussion and uh, bring in questions from the audience, um, please, you may ask uh, questions using the Q&A function in, in Zoom or uh, directly on Facebook, uh, where we have a live feed. But uh, First, a quick round uh, from what you just have heard from each other. Is there anything you would like to comment on? Uh, Sabine, Angela mentioned, uh, you know, the, the, the future. Um, it, it's, uh, it depends on what happens, obviously, but still sort of how, uh, how, how, how will we, uh, where will we be? Uh, going ahead now? Will we reach a new equilibrium? Will there be a recalibration? Uh, public opinion was mentioned. Um, and then also the, the, the more critical points perhaps that, that John Luff uh, mentioned. Is there anything you would like to add to that, please? Yeah, maybe briefly on, on public opinion and um, perceptions um, now since the war started. Um, I mean, John already, uh, mentioned the shock. I think the shock here is huge and it's very, very broadly perceived in, in German society. We really, I think, have a shift. And um, if you look at recent um, opinion polls, you can see that very clearly. At the same time, there is um, a tangible, if you like, marginalization of the quote and yeah, <laughs> in quotation marks, the, the Russland Verstehe. Yeah, there is a marginalization in the Russia debate, which is very important, I think, of the AFD, the, the alternative for Germany, and also the left. I mean, this is something, again, this is a trend in my view. Um, this was um, pretty visible already last year and around the elections. Um, and it is very strong right now. And this concerns, um, this also includes the Eastern uh, German Bundesländer states. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, so I think this is an important change. I, my prognosis is actually that is that it will be sustainable, that um, this is very, very unlikely to go away because the crisis will not go away. And I mean, this is something that people like me, <laughs> I've been trying to um, explain, including to the German audience for some time, that this is, um, this is basically an evolving crisis that will stay with us for a long time. And I think this is now really sinking in with the public, but also with the political elite. Um, and yeah, and, I, and this is why I believe that the shift will, this shift will, will, um, will be sustained. 
Um, yeah, and just to make that clear once again, I mean, what is really important that is that unlike previously, Russia is now being perceived as an immediate security threat. This is really, this is a sea change for, for German public opinion, because this was never the case until literally three weeks ago. Um, three, until three weeks ago, uh, the German public, the majority of the German public um, looked at internal developments in Russia and didn't like them, criticized, um, whatever uh, assaults like the one uh, on, on Alexei Navalny or others um, was sympathetic with the Russian opposition, with Russian civil society. Memorial is a very important um, example here. I mean, many people in Germany followed the fate of Memorial over the past year, and there was a lot of sympathy, but never ever was Russia perceived as an immediate security threat for Germany. And this has changed. And I think this will have um, a very strong impact on the German debate for a long time to come. And yeah, and this is also basically my answer to, to your question about the future, if you mean German policy. Yeah, I think, um, you know, concerning the European, the, the European security system, now, everything depends on how this horrible war evolves and what the result of the war will be. So I think here we have only questions for now and very few answers. Indeed, and it's uncertain what will happen if, um, if the conflict escalates uh, within Ukraine, maybe even without, uh, outside of Ukraine. Uh, the number of refugees could increase significantly. Uh, the nuclear capabilities that Putin uh, has hinted towards may in a, a, a worse, uh, if not worst case scenario, also come into play. Um, Angela, uh, do you have any further thoughts that you would like to add at this point? I mean, just, just a couple. Um, you know, on the point of the shock, I mean, I think Germans, may, maybe of all Europeans, were very shocked by this, as Sabino said, they didn't expect it. And the sense that the European continent was really threatened by Russia. You know, we are worried about this inadvertently spreading to one of the Eastern NATO countries. So we're now suddenly talk about scenarios that it involve a NATO-Russia clash, the potential use of nuclear weapons that really nobody thought we had to talk about you know, for the past decades. Um, and that shock is, I think, felt much more acutely in Germany, in Europe than it is in the United States, because obviously we're further away and we don't feel directly threatened by this. I just wanted to sort of amplify one of the points that John made about the view that sort of Ukraine was a bit of a nuisance. I think there was this feeling in some uh, uh, corners in, in Germany that if only the Ukrainians, you know, didn't present such a problem, then the relationship with Russia would be much uh, better. And I think for a long time, you had the German historical narrative, you know, we have the special responsibility for Russia because of what happened uh, in 1941 um, and, and, and what happened during World War II, forgetting obviously that the invasion route uh, by the Nazis, you know, came through Ukraine. And I think it's only more recently that you've had German officials saying, we also have a historical responsibility towards Ukraine because of the number of Ukrainians who were killed in World War II. So I think that's, you know, that has been a shift, but I think that's come much later to Germany. And I think the view that if only, you know, the Ukrainians could have kept quieter, then Germany could have pursued, you know, a, a better relationship with Russia. I think uh, that also took too long uh, to be questioned. Sabina, you're raising your hand. Do you have a quick comment on that? Yeah, just a very brief comment. Um, I agree with Angela. I think the, um, the awareness that Germany has a responsibility, not only vis-a-vis -vis Russia, but also indeed vis-a-vis -vis, um, other states and societies that were you know, horribly affected by, by the crimes of Nazi Germany in the Second World War, this awareness started with the annexation of Crimea and the beginning of the war in the Donbass. I mean, this is the moment when the debate about Germany's responsibility towards these countries started. And yeah, so this is when this started. And then I wanted to add 
One um, one point to what what I think Angela said said about the 1990s. I mean, it is true that Germany um, acquired this role of Russia's advocate in within the European Union, within NATO, and very strongly advocated rapprochement between um, Russia and the West. But please let's not forget that Germany also advocate advocated um, EU and NATO accession of the Central Eastern European countries and really perceived its own responsibility vis-a-vis -vis those countries in the 1990s and acted on this responsibility. I mean, I really would like to make this point because um, I think it is very important. Although one may perhaps make a distinction there between Central European states and Eastern European state, the Eastern partnership state no this is exactly what i say you yeah. know i mean the, yeah. the 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 debate about the eastern the the so-called former soviet republics the eastern partnership countries that started in 2014 so with a delay of say 15 years if you like yeah but the central eastern european countries and i mean after the accession after the the eu enlargement in 20 um in 2004 Central Eastern European states really forced Germany to start thinking about the new neighbors of the European Union. I mean, this is another shift in the German debate that was basically, um, yeah, uh, Germany was pushed to, to, to this to start this debate. But I mean, I think this is one of the um, effects of the of EU enlargement on um, the German debate about Eastern Europe. Thank you. We will soon bring in the questions from the audience. Uh, but John, any further thoughts from your side? Yeah, just one 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 thing uh, occurred to me listening to the discussion just now, um, and just how you know quickly things have changed, which is uh, sometimes the case in in, in Germany. So they change uh, over, overnight. When uh, Olaf Scholz uh, went to Moscow recently um, for his uh, inaugural uh, visit, very um, challenging uh, visit for him. You know, to be sitting at that very long table, uh, so far from Putin, and you know being lectured again about all Russia's uh, grievances. Uh, he got through it pretty well. You, you could see that um, you know he was um, he, he was still learning, um, but he by and large kept you know, kept to the talking points. But one thing that he he said really really struck me, and this this sort of old thinking that's still present in the in the German establishment, at least was up until um, uh, 13 days ago. Um, he said that uh, we can only have security with Russia, not against Russia. Now. During the Cold War, we had to have security against the Soviet Union, and I think we managed it pretty well. And we we have to learn those habits again, and, and, and Germany has to do that again. We will get through this. And I'm personally of the view that uh, history is, is a great guide to the future when it comes to Russia, because Russia will have to get back again onto the reform track. Russia is not permanently going to be in uh, this condition. Indeed, I would say that uh, this tragic miscalculation um, that or appalling miscalculation by President Putin to uh, start a war with Ukraine is in fact going to accelerate that historical process. And um, he, he will certainly not be in, in, in office as long as many people expected. The question is, at that point, will Germany and its allies be better prepared than they were in 1991? When the Soviet Union collapsed, for the type of institutional change that should need to take place in Russia, and that's where I hope that Germany will be thinking not just about what it has to do today and tomorrow, um, but what we need to be prepared for the day after tomorrow. Thank you. Um, I now look at the questions from the audience, and we have one from an anonymous listener wondering about how um, relationships with individual Russian citizens uh, can be kept up, uh, how not to lose them in the long run. Um, and if I may add a little bit to that as well, I guess the need for or perceived need for dialogue uh, and people to people contacts that Germany has had, it may be a bit hard to see that disappear completely. Um, and there will be a need to uh, provide people within Russia with uh, objective information uh, to support civil society and so on and so forth. Um, what's the German debate on that? Has, has the strategic thinking uh, reached that stage that, that people are thinking about these, this, these things in light of the increasing repression within Russia? 
um, how can we keep up contact with them? Any thoughts there from anyone? I, I can jump in if you, if, you, if you want. I mean, this is an area um, that I've worked in for a number of years, including in Russia until the beginning of last year. So, um, so I mean, indeed, from a German perspective, um, this remains very important. And at the same time, it is very, very clear that the, the spaces for people-to-people -people contacts are not only shrinking, they're basically zero now. And this is a huge problem. So political foundations are withdrawing, they're closing their, their, their offices, the German political foundations, um, excuse me. They're closing their offices, you know, bringing local um, staff out of the country because being affiliated to a German political foundation has become dangerous. Um, it's the same for other organizations operating in Russia. Um, the Goethe Institute in Moscow, and its regional offices, they are still working and they hope to be able to keep this up. Um, they are relatively far removed from, from politics. So perhaps there is some hope, but um, I think, yeah, it, it will become more difficult for them as well. And I think, um, I mean, it's a little bit too early to, to really see what can be done in Russia in the future. I'm relatively pessimistic. I think we will have to um, start working very intensely with the Russian diaspora, which is growing as we speak, because I mean, the exodus from Russia of um, people who have liberal attitudes and opinions and who are politically active journalists, civil society representative, et cetera, et cetera, is it's just mind boggling as a matter of fact. And many of these people, of course, um, or yeah, not, not few in any event will, will end up in Germany because they have very good contacts in Germany. So, this, so I think this will be one of the pillars of our future work with Russian society will be working with the diaspora and in the hope that through the diaspora and through their contacts with their home country, um, we can keep in touch in one way or, or another, but it, it will become very, very difficult. Thank you. Angela, please. Yeah, just, uh, I mean, to reinforce that, I've heard a figure that as many as 200,000 people have left since the war began of Russians. Um, I just note that, you know, from the point of view of academia, um, you've had all of the, the rectors of all the major academic institutions in Russia, including places like the Higher School of Economics, which we thought was a kind of more liberal place uh, with a diversity of ideas. They've all signed statements endorsing the war, uh, you know, and endorsing the, the Kremlin's version of events. So I think it's going to be very difficult, at least in the immediate future, to continue the kind of academic exchanges we've had before the student exchanges. Um, and many Russians that I know just feel that, you know, the door is closing on them, literally, uh, the borders might be closed, but in general, the ability to express, you know, ideas that are different from uh, the, those that are now propagated by the Kremlin, where you can face up to 15 years in prison, if you use words like war and invasion, I think it's going to be extremely challenging, um, you know, for the next few years, at least, unless John is right and change comes quicker than we, we, than we think it might, but we do have to continue. Um, but what, we're gonna to have to be very inventive and dealing with the diaspora. And actually, again, if you think even about academia, we're now thinking, you know, how could we find places in different universities and educational institutions to help these people who are leaving Russia, uh, you know, continue their work and hopefully one day they can go back there. So um, we haven't faced a situation like this really since the darkest days of the Cold War. Thank you. Um, we have also a question about refugees, and this is, a, of course, a huge uh, topic. Uh, we had a, a major crisis uh, in 2015, 2016. Now uh, we see reports that over 2 million people have already left Ukraine um, in, in the past two weeks. And there's a question from Dominic about how the greater EU, including Germany, is preparing to help evacuate uh, stranded Ukrainians, but also wondering if, if there's any German policy towards um, those who have to leave 
Ukraine. Um, any thoughts on those things, the refugee aspect and humanitarian issues in general? So, John, shall I maybe, maybe uh, try to answer that question first of all? I'm not so familiar with the <clears throat> the, the German policy, um, although I, I, I do recognize that um, some German NGOs are doing fantastic work to uh, to try try and help people um, out of Ukraine and, and to, to get to a safe place. We are going to, I think, in the short term, clearly see um, a, a very rapid uh, increase in the number of refugees, which is um, going to put a lot of strain um, on several European countries. Poland has been very much in the lead so far. Um, Hungary, uh, Hungary and uh, Slovakia, Romania, um, th these places are, are going to have a greater influx of, of uh, refugees. My, my, my country, sadly, is um, not doing uh, nearly enough in this area at the moment. And we are all going to be, I think, uh, very tested. Now, the, que the question is, if this war can be brought to an end soon, and, and let's hope to God that it does happen soon, are these people going to go back? We saw in 1999, uh, when the greater part of the um, uh, Kosovo Albanian population was expelled from the country uh, by the Serbian uh, regime, the, the vast majority of those people returned very quickly. Uh, but it's not clear to me that we're going to have the same sort of situation um, in Ukraine, because in the case of Kosovo, we had a, a NATO peacekeeping force on the ground. And that made all the difference and allowed people to believe that they could actually resume their lives. I think in the case of Ukraine, this is going to be much, much more difficult. We're running out of time. Uh, uh, we could uh, go on for uh, much longer, I believe, but I would like to give uh, all of you um, the uh, opportunity, if you have any short final remarks, um, key takeaways, um, policy recommendations to the German government regarding Russia and Eastern Europe, as well as to other countries engaging with Germany on, on these uh, issues. Um, please, um, any short thoughts there? Sabina. Maybe I, I start really literally two sentences. I mean, I think um, I agree with, with John and also Angela. Um, so Germany will have to rethink the, the fundamentals of, of its policy towards Russia. And I think the, the process of reformulation has already started. I mean, I, I literally half an hour before we started with our webinar, I, I came home from a high level meeting with, um, you know, Social Democratic Party, and we were discussing exactly that. So what does all this mean for the, the line of the, the political line of the social democrats, but also really uh, of the German government. So I think this is, it's ongoing and um, yeah. And I think the new German policy towards Russia, but also towards the Eastern neighbors and within the framework of the Western Alliance will be very different from, um, from German policy in the past. Maybe Thank I would you. just add to that, that um, I think what's been remarkable is the transatlantic coordination, particularly coordination between the United States and Germany and obviously other European allies too. Um, I think there's not a large gap now between the way we all view what's happening in this Russian-Ukrainian war and also the question of how you deal with Russia going forward. So it's, it's too bad that under these tragic circumstances, this has been a wake up call to really have greater allied unity over this. And hopefully this, this will go forward. Um, my concern is if this conflict drags on uh, for a long time, will, will you know, the United States maybe lose focus? I think Germany's less likely to use, lose focus because it's right there uh, on, the, on the back door. But I think this, uh, you know, formulating and uh, a united um, transatlantic policy going forward will be very important. John, please. Yeah, thank you, John. If I could just echo what uh, Angela said, I, I think it has been remarkable, in fact, how we've managed to define this degree of consensus between uh, Europe and the United States in a very short period of time. If you think back to uh, 2014, uh, it took the EU several months to unveil a sanctions package and then a pretty mild sanctions pack package against uh, Russia. Uh, and it would not have happened if there had not been the shooting down of the Malaysian airliner. So we've, we've learned some lessons along the way. Uh, I think the, 
the big short-term challenge uh, for Germany is to, to be able to manage uh, a potentially very serious energy crisis. And I, I don't think the Russians are bluffing when they're talking about uh, cutting off, um, for example, the Nord Stream 1 pipeline. And this could put um, Germany under a great deal of pressure. So it's going to have to move very quickly to uh, revise its energy, energy policy and to reduce this excessive dependence on uh, Russian fossil fuels. Sabina, you raised your... Yeah, I just wanted to add one um, thing to, the, to, to what John just said about the energy crisis, which is really imminent and it will be very serious. So this is, I mean, we're happy that we're at the end of the winter now, but, um, you know, generally this is a very serious situation for Germany. But just to make clear the extent to which public opinion has shifted, um, in a recent poll, a large majority, I don't remember the exact figure, 65, 70% said they were prepared to accept additional costs, um, you know, that as, as implications of sanctions against Russia because of, the, of Russia's aggression against Ukraine. So this gives you a glimpse of what is going on um, in public opinion in Germany at the moment. So there's a much larger acceptance of costs and of the implications of this crisis. Thank you so much. Uh, developments continue. The, the Russia crisis is not over. Um, the discussion uh, about what could and should be done will also continue. But uh, we've learned uh, quite a lot today. And thank you all for your excellent contributions. Uh, Sabine Fischer from the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, SWP. Uh, Angela Stent from Brookings Institution and Georgetown University, and John Luff from Chatham House. Please, uh, everyone listening, look these people up, follow what they are saying and doing. They're providing excellent analysis and commentary. Uh, and also keep an eye on what's coming, coming from the Stockholm Center for uh, Eastern European Studies. We will also try to contribute to this discussion. And thank you all for watching and contributing with questions. All the best from Stockholm. Thank you.